<clears throat> I think we're live. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Early Words Weekly Explorer webinar. My name is Chris Poria. Uh, this webinar series is run by Early Words team uh, to promote disruptive leaders, especially innovators, uh, mostly focused on startups, scale-ups, uh, who have a minimum viable product or more. But today, uh, we are going to talk about an industry sector itself. But today, we are going to go into a different topic. We are going to um, talk about, or we are going to get more insights, actually, uh, on this topic. Um, can actionable innovation accelerate Australia's transition to hydrogen energy? Uh, today, I have two special guests, Joe Kovedi and uh, Suren Turoi Raja. Uh, Joe and Suren are the vet veterans in energy sector. Uh, Joe is a member of uh, the Early Birds Advisory Board, and Suren is a member of our um, SME team, which is subject matter experts teams. Uh, just to give you a brief, um, just to give you a brief introduction, um, Joe is a senior executive with over 25 years of experience um, in the energy sector, working with innovative service companies in leadership roles, uh, delivering solutions to complex engineering challenges. Um, he has broad industry experience in engineering, um, asset management, corporate risk, uh, and strategy. He also holds a master's degree in engineering and also a graduate of uh, Australian Institute of company directors. Um, Joe cares about both the outcome and how it is delivered. Uh, just a little bit about Suren. Uh, Suren is a project and business management professional uh, with many years of global experience in consulting and innovative project delivery, especially in energy industry. Um, he has held executive commercial and technical roles in large global organizations in Australia, uh, as well as in the United States. Uh, Suren is passionate about the transition to green energy, and in particular, the transition from fossil fuels to hydrogen. Um, is currently a consultant advising on innovation and solutions for energy transition supply chain. So Joe and Suren are going to share an alternative pathway to fast track innovations in hydrogen energy, accelerating the move toward net zero emission targets. Uh, they have used early birds data to undertake their research and will provide some great insights today. Um, attendees, uh, please share your questions through the chat box in the meantime. Uh, and I'm handing over to Joe. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Chris. Um, look, I'll just share my screen now. Hopefully that works okay. Yeah. Hi, everybody. So you can see the screen there? Yep. Yes. All good. Great. So I guess, um, you know, with the, the general philosophy here, um, you know, we've taken a look inside the early birds um, uh, marketplace, the database. And, you know, the beginning of all of this is really kickstarting innovation uh, and collaboration. Actionable innovation is really where we want to be, but we felt that as a starting point, kickstart was, was probably a good place to uh, commence the, the journey, let's say. So we're looking at hydrogen projects. We're using what we consider to be an, an innovative ecosystem um, with early birds and, you know, comparing with the experience that Seren and I have had, uh, particularly with oil and gas projects over the last few decades, um, we, we think there are some interesting findings. So I'll just click through. Whoops. So if we look at the background and what some of the challenges are, clearly uh, you can't pick up a newspaper without reading about energy transition. It's clearly accelerating, not just happening, but moving quite quickly. Um, unprecedented is a word that gets used quite a lot, not just with COVID, but certainly with uh, the energy transition. 
you hear a lot about net zero emissions, you know, so yes, there will be emissions, but um, how do we offset those emissions against carbon um, uh, uh, credits, let's say? Uh, so there's lots to consider in that space as companies and, you know, or, um, countries and states uh, set themselves targets for net zero. Hydrogen's a clear contender, you know, and, and in certain uh, sectors uh, like heavy transport, uh, whether that be rail, uh, marine uh, or trucks, you know, it's, it's already viable if you can get hydrogen in the volumes that you're looking for and can easily displace the fossil fuels, as I say, in some of those key sectors. So the issue now seems to be the chicken and egg. How do you accelerate innovation, which is required, and we'll go through that. Uh, shortly um, to support that transition. That transition, the um, the ecosystem with early birds, we think is is certainly uh, well placed to you know bring in the early adopters, bring in the innovators, bring in the subject matter experts uh, into that ecosystem and really uh, accelerate. Um, so we're you know creating connections. The database hosts more than a million innovators, as we know. Uh, and there's real opportunities there for early adopters to, to take big steps um, in fast tracking their innovation. So when we look at the broad market, um, generally speaking, hydrogen production has been, is split into what some organizations would call blue hydrogen and green hydrogen. Green hydrogen is where everybody wants to be. Um, getting us much closer to net zero uh, emissions. Electrolysis is the process that's used, basically breaking down water into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, but, uh, you know, according to the International Energy Agency, IEA, um, three quarters of global production at the moment is from uh, steam reforming, which is essentially breaking down methane into hydrogen. So, you know, there's a long way to go to produce large amounts of green hydrogen, I would say a very long way to go. And when you look at the supply chain, there's opportunities for innovation every step of the way. Um, green hydrogen being the electrolysis process with all of the challenges, I guess, that the renewable sector faces, um, grabbing large market share and bringing um, um, systems and processes and reliable energy production to electrolysis to be able to produce that hydrogen reliably. And then all the challenges with transport, storage, transportation, and then the end, end use cases in industrial chemicals, uh, power generation and storage. And then obviously for a country like Australia, liquefaction and export is a key, um, uh, is a key uh, really to, to the future of uh, you know, that sector here, because our population just doesn't justify producing large volumes of, of, of hydrogen for domestic usage. Um, Two dollars a kilo is the target that's been set by the Australian government. Um, I put the two dollars over there just, just you know, at the beginning of the end use cases. So I think if you can produce hydrogen, transport it, and get it to the location where it's about to be used for under two dollars a kilo, you're uh, you're in you're in a good place. Um, looking at some of the IEA data. Um, one of the problems that blue hydrogen faces um, is, is the carbon capture and storage. The, the emissions associated with blue hydrogen um, create CO2. So, you know, that at the moment, the one, of the one of the most robust and proven ways, I've worked on a carbon capture and storage project for about 10 years, and, and it does work, um, and it's a robust technology. So but it is expensive, you know, that's an additional cost to um, uh, hydrogen manufacturing, which you could do without. So green hydrogen production doesn't have that requirement. So that's just a snapshot of what the market looks like. What Seren and I did then over the last probably three or four months, we've attended a bunch of different webinars and um, listened to a number of experts um, from large energy companies through to uh, independent experts and consultants and essentially uh, put together this list of, of where the challenges are that we see. <clears throat> um, I, I probably won't go through 
one bullet at a time, but just the three broad categories that we always come back to are the production issues and challenges. And a lot of that has to do with power. So the power generation uh, to drive the electrolysis process, doing that um, green firstly and doing it cheaply <laughs> is you know, a two key challenges, really making sure that <clears throat> we can get um, enough power, stable power, to drive electrolysis on a continuous process uh, and, and do that all um, for less than $2 a kilogram. Mobile storage and transport is the other big area. So format um, of the storage, you know, is it being transported in a pipeline, in a gas form, in a liquid form? Um, and then if you want to put it in a truck or in a ship, how do you do that? Um, hydrogen has, uh, you know, there are, there are certain perceptions around stability and safety of handling hydrogen, which all need to be overcome. Uh, and you've got, you know, the international standards and uh, codes of practice that you need to comply with as well. <clears throat> and again, doing all of that, uh, a, lo a lot of this, I mean, electrolysis has been around for, for decades. People have been able to create hydrogen for a long, long time. But again, doing it on a, on a large scale is not the simplest thing. And then I guess you get to the end use cases where, yes, uh, there needs to be a lot of work done in developing robust, um, cost-effective uh, end use cases. And we've seen opportunities from, you know, uh, setting out um, you know, heavy transport, as I said earlier, trucks, trains, ships, um, right through to uh, hydrogen powered barbecues. Um, so those end, those end use cases are emerging and emerging all the time. Uh, there's a lot of money being spent in R&D developing uh, all of those cases. But again, to roll out a, a, a new a brand of hydrogen powered barbecues, you need a, a reliable supply of hydrogen. So you come back to that cycle of produce, transport, and, and use, uh, and you keep going around and around and around in that cycle. And there's innovation opportunities at every step, okay? Um, at that point, I think Seren is on the line. I might hand over to him to let him take you through the next few slides. Are you there, Seren? I certainly am. Great. Can you hear me? Yep. I'll just switch off uh, my audio and let you take over. And uh, when you need me to click to the next slide, just let me know, okay? Thank you, Joe. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, so Joe's been taking you through uh, the challenges uh, in the, the hydrogen transition that uh, we're faced with. Uh, obviously, there are different parts of the world that are uh, more advanced than we are. Uh, some countries, you know, Korea and some countries in Europe, uh, Europe not not. North Korea, but South Korea and some of the European countries have really advanced in this uh, this area and made some serious commitment at uh, at uh, the country level. So, what what do we do? You know, how can how can um, the early birds uh, platform and ecosystem uh, add some value to this uh, this hydrogen transition? Uh, so, we we had a look at the uh, the database as it is. Uh, we currently have uh, more than a million. Uh, innovators uh, registered through the, the, the database. And uh, we did a search, uh, sort of a basic search uh, for hydrogen and uh, more than 200 innovators came up uh, uh, in that area. And so uh, we analyzed uh, those 200 and went through them in, in, in sort of detail to figure out what kind of hydrogen uh, industry are they in. Uh, obviously hydrogen is, is uh, uh, if, if the scientists amongst you should know it's the number one uh, item on the periodic table and it's been around for a while and it's got lots of uses. Uh, the most simplest one, which is uh, used for uh, energy, is something that we haven't really pursued and this is the opportunity we're talking about. So we focused on, you know, the, the hydrogen associated uh, uh, innovators who, who really um, are adding value to the hydrogen energy transition activities and we were able to bring it down to about 90 plus and as you can see in the chart uh, a lot of them happen to be in, uh, in europe and america uh, very little in this uh, this part of the world as a matter of fact we could only find two registered uh, uh, 
innovators from Australia. There is a bit of activity in uh, you know South Korea and Japan, etc. But most of the activity is really in in Europe. Uh, the, the 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 folks in Europe, the, the governments there have taken energy transition and the transition to green energy very seriously and uh, are committing some government funding as well as you know private sector funding. And so there are a lot of uh, innovations out there, innovations being promoted in that area as well, uh, in those regions as well. So lots happening. So uh, as I said, we, we've managed to hone in on about 90. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's more, but on the first pass uh, analysis, we came up with about 90. And of those 90, we found that uh, almost three fourths of them have actually got innovative products. Uh, some of them, uh, one fourth of those um, uh, innovators basically focused on providing a service, uh, providing end to end supply chain uh, uh, opportunities, uh, you know, design uh, and, and consulting services. But the interesting fact is the significant number are associated with um, innovative products. And that's the bit that's really going to help um, Australia and, and countries that are new players in the energy transition to sort of uh, take advantage of and um, move forward quickly. So once you look at the innovative products themselves, there is a you know, wide range of uh, products that uh, are uh, being uh, uh, sort of promoted. They are at various levels of maturity. And uh, the chart below at the bottom basically shows the a bit of a breakdown of uh, of the products themselves. And as you can see, uh, the, the the tallest uh, uh, Manhattan bar there shows fuel cells. Fuel cells are one big area of uh, focus at the moment. There's a lot of activity out there and a lot of uh, maturity. You know, if you think about what's happening in in South Korea. If you think about what's happening in, in Norway, Switzerland, and Germany, uh, they are transitioning, uh, you know, trucks and uh, heavy vehicles. Uh, in, in South Korea, they're tr moving, um, you know, cars, buses, etc., to be run by hydrogen using the fuel cell technology. Th thanks, Joe. If you um, go to the next slide. So. How is it going to help us uh, in terms of uh, solving some of the Australian challenges? So Australia is, is starting to take uh, the hydrogen transition and the overall energy transition seriously now. Uh, the CSIRO currently reports about 54 projects that are underway at different stages. Uh, some of them are very conceptual, some of them are actually advanced, and some of them are uh, in construction. There's a fair amount of research projects also going ahead. Um, 18 of these are at universities. What that means is that there's a lot of challenges associated with getting hydrogen technology out to the market. And, and to solve these challenges, there are some research projects. Um, quite clearly, uh, you know, Joe mentioned that, you know, we've been attending a lot of uh, webinars on, on, on various uh, aspects of the hydrogen transition. Uh, quite clearly, industry, the academics, and the, the government are jointly attempting to resolve a lot of these challenges. So what we've actually observed is the fact that there's a lot of activity at a university level, at research level. So quite clearly, there is a need to resolve some of these challenges or roadblocks uh, to help us transition uh, to the hydrogen world quickly. Uh, we also identified the fact that there were limited local innovators with solutions to some of these key challenges. Uh, as I mentioned from the chart before, there's a lot of activity that's uh, already underway in, in other parts of the world. Um, by going through research and uh, investigation and studies and uh, analysis, are we actually reinventing the wheel? Uh, have some of these challenges been resolved already in some other parts of the world? Um, we don't have to go far. I mean, if you just look at New Zealand, they, they're basically uh, re a recent project that's been announced uh, has got the full supply chain from hydrogen generation all the way through to hydrogen trucks uh, being refueled uh, so that they can run the heavy haulage or transition the heavy haulage to hydrogen uh, powered trucks. So that's ha that's happening. That's, that's underway. Uh, so, you know, the question is, are we 
reinventing or inventing some of these things by focusing on research and 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 starting from scratch uh, or are we innovating and and where the early birds uh, platform comes in is basically the fact that there are innovators out there who actually solve some of these problems uh, obviously in the industry is pushing really hard to fast track some of these developments uh, the targets uh, joe mentioned that uh, you know 2 dollars a kilogram target that is set for i believe 2030 which is not long to go joe and i are um, experience uh, energy uh, project guys and we know how long it takes to uh, uh, you know take an energy project from start from concept all the way through to uh, you know uh, going live or starting up so we really don't have much time um, so the early birds um, platform and the uh, uh, ecosystem has got uh, an opportunity to help us uh, accelerate some of these uh, uh, needs. Next slide, please, Joe. So what is this early birds uh, ecosystem? Uh, some of you might be familiar with it, but uh, in summary, it's basically bringing together three major stakeholders. One is the growing community of early adopters. Uh, there are a lot of companies and, and organizations out there who want to adopt early some of these modern and new innovative technologies. Uh, they obviously don't have the, the time or the resources to do that in-house. And so getting on board and looking at what's out there and, and uh, you know funding them, uh, incubating them, uh, buying from them, etc., is is an opportunity for early adopters. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they are really looking for actionable innovation. They're, they're looking at uh, not reinventing the wheel or inventing stuff, but looking at innovation, how they can quickly turn things around. Uh, they're looking for the next disruption. Then there's a big community of innovators. There's a lot of smart people out there, a lot of people with ideas. Uh, as I said earlier, there's a, more than a million, 1.1 million currently of innovators that can be accessed through the early birds ecosystem. Uh, what do they bring to the table? They have disruptive technologies. Uh, they, they're looking for commercialization opportunities. Uh, you know, they, they've got uh, methods for, you know, getting around these complex procurement processes that some of these early adopters or big organizations uh, have. Um, unfortunately, these these uh, innovators have limited resources. So, they, you know, by being on the uh, platform, they're able to access uh, early adopters. And uh, the third group, uh, which is the SME consultants. Uh, I believe uh, Chris gave us an update now. We, we nearly have about 100 SME consultants on board. Uh, and what do they bring to the table? They, they have got unique experience in various aspects. So Joe and myself, we're basically experts on the energy area. And, uh, you know, we are bringing to the table uh, some of our, you know, many, many years of energy experience uh, to uh, transition into the hydrogen uh, uh, space. So um, the marketplace basically has got this, those three groups of people coming together and basically solving uh, some of these problems. So what do we recommend? Basically, what we're saying is that COVID-19 has basically created a, a bit of urgency. Uh, it's identified the fact that our resources are limited. We have to use them wisely. Uh, the Australian government's seriously committed to the energy transition. Green energy and green hydrogen has got excellent credentials, environmental credition in terms of net zero emission to the, the atmosphere. So let's collaborate let's use the innovators on the platform and fast track innovation uh, that's what we're proposing and recommending uh, the early birds consultants can facilitate bringing together of these uh, people or, or early adopters uh, who have challenges and, and these innovators out there can solve these challenges so that's what we're recommending joe do you have anything else to add You may be muted. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, no, I think that's a great summary, Seren. I, I think uh, given the timing, 
we've only got a few minutes left. We might open it to questions. <clears throat> um, Chris, do you want to take over from there? No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Soren and Joe. Uh, great presentation. So given that we have limited time left, uh, but we already have some questions. The first question is, uh, are there examples of green hydrogen production in Australia? Uh, if not, what needs to be done to provide the innovation to establish this capability in Australia? Yeah, so oh, look, I'm happy to have a go at that one, Seren, if you like. The, there are a number of projects. There's one in South Australia. There's one in Victoria where you would say there's a hybrid green uh, hydrogen. The, the you know, the attempt is, so there is a, an electrolysis facility, but the access, uh, you know, being solar and, and wind being the main renewable, <clears throat> um, I guess uh, different companies have a different view on what you might call green hydrogen. Um, and so I would say it's transitioning, a lot of those transitioning from blue to green. Um, you'll find some people call, uh, you know, some of the pilot facilities that are being built <clears throat> um, green, but um, it's open to discussion, I would say, as to whether they're truly green. A green hydrogen facility would be one that generates all of its all of its power in is is from renewable sources, and there is uh, no there are no emissions. I don't know that we've exactly got to that point yet in Australia. Joe, if I may add, uh, there is oh. a, a potential project that uh, is uh, going to kick off in uh, Tasmania. And that is truly green because they're yeah. looking at uh, powering the, uh, the hydrogen plant using hydroelectric energy in, right, in, in yeah. Tasmania. Yeah, that's a good so, point. You know, solar, wind, hydroelectric, those, those give you true green uh, you know, energy that's required to break the, the water into hydrogen and oxygen. Yep. Um, and so the biggest debate in Australia, I guess, is the fact that uh, we've got a lot of blue, a lot of gas. Right. And so that's blue energy, uh, blue hydrogen. And, uh, you know, the, the cost of carbon capture and storage is quite prohibitive. And to get around that, that, that is the, the key to all of this. Great. Great, guys. The next question coming from Gordon uh, saying that I, I assume you need fresh water as in salt water. How is supply guaranteed in times of drought, et cetera? Um, go ahead, Seren. You, you've had a look at this one. Looks, as well. looks like I've, 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 my screen is frozen, <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> we can hear you. Go ahead. That's yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, what, what I was going to say is that, uh, again, you know, we, we're talking about challenges, right? That is a key challenge. In Australia, we've got a shortage of water. So, so building a hydrogen plant next to a, a hydroelectric project, yeah, that sort of resolves it. But we don't have hydroelectric projects everywhere. For us, the biggest source of energy is is uh, solar. I don't know if you heard today's news. Uh, South Australia has officially now moved to 100% powered by solar. Mm. That is a massive milestone, right? Mm. So, yes, we have a, a problem with water, but there is a lot of innovators out there who have come up with technology to break down seawater, which is abundantly available, right? Mm. It's It's still not fully advanced, but there's a lot of research being done already at Stanford University. They had, uh, they've actually, in their opinion, they've resolved it, but it's a, it's a matter of commercializing it. There's a lot of other innovators that I have come across on the website, on, on the early birds platform that are experts in this area. So right. seawater, break it down it, and, and uh, yeah. So, so the big issue with seawater is, is corrosion of the, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, the electrolyzers. And, and there, are, there are companies with innovations out there that can solve that. Great. Uh, we've got next question. Uh, without widespread hydrogen distribution and infrastructure, uh, who are early adopters uh, in Australia that you envision? Uh, what part of industry? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I, I uh, you know, Alan Finkel, came out, I think, last week and provided some information around this where he said, um, I don't want to misquote him or anything, but basically uh, along the lines that we need to develop a domestic market for hydrogen and prove prove it domestically before we can export. The export market is, is huge, potentially, yeah. but Australia has some challenges, yeah? I mean, uh, 
even you know you may not you know in countries like the the Middle East and um, and in the US where they've got abundant supplies of low cost gas they can actually do um, uh, you know blue hydrogen um, at a at a at, at pretty cost effective um, rates so. I think we need to be um, be mindful of that. Seren, do you, do you want to add anything to that? No, that's uh, that's a fair fair response, basically. Yeah. No, thank you very much, guys, and very good presentation. And um, uh, sorry, we are just running out of time, but really appreciate uh, your presentation. Very interesting and insightful. I'm sure that people will contact you uh, directly, or if you do not have uh, contact details. Or Joe and Surin, we reach out to to Jeff or myself. We are more than happy to introduce you to both Surin and Joe. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, guys. You have a great day. Uh, looking forward to talking to you further. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, everybody.